My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the artistic director here at TIFF. I want to thank you all for coming out. I'm very glad to see you all here. Um, to begin, we want to acknowledge the land that we're on today. This is the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat First Nations. They have been taking care of this land for thousands of years, and we thank them for that, and we're very um, pleased and grateful to be a part of this community. A reminder, you may already know this, but a reminder that this film is eligible for our most important prize. We want you to vote because you decide the prize. That's the Grolsch People's Choice Award. You can go online uh, to vote at tiff.net slash vote for the films of your choice. Uh, big thanks to Radiant Films International for providing us with this film. And I am so pleased to welcome Nandita Das back to Toronto. It's been 10 years since her last film uh, that she directed, Farak, premiered here. And uh, our festivals change a lot in 10 years. Um, but Nandita has been consistent. Uh, she is, I think, one of the most principled and creative filmmakers that I know and has um, taken the time to choose the right projects to direct. She is, of course, also an actor and has acted in uh, many films over the years, including uh, Deepa Mehta's films Fire and Earth, which is when I, I first came to know her work on screen. But in that time, in the time since she began uh, working as an actor, she's also found many stories that she wants to tell herself uh, as a director. And um, I remember speaking with her over the years about her interest in the writings of um, Sadat Manto, uh, the great Indian author, and um, his the, the radical breaks that he made in terms of how he, he uh, transformed what writing could do in India and how he was willing to stand up for it. And, Everything that he did as a writer, I think, are the things that uh, Nandita herself wants to do as a filmmaker and wants for art generally. She wants art to be free, and Manto was an emblem of a free artist. Uh, she has spent uh, years bringing this story to the screen. It premiered at the Cannes Film Festival to great success, and you were the first audience in North America to see it. She's come to present it to you this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Nandita Das. Thank you, Cameron. You said some of the things that I was planning to say, oh. so <laughs> no, thank you. You did half the work. So yes, my journey in Toronto at TIFF is 22 years old. And backstage, I just found out that's as long as Cameron has had an association with TIFF. Um, yes, it began with Fire, and I would say then Earth, and then many other films as an actor, then Firak 10 years ago, and I'm back with Manto. Manto is a very special film for me. I guess I would say that for Firak as well. When you are not sort of seeking out for a project, you're not looking for a script, and something just almost compels you to tell a story, then you know you, you just almost don't have a choice. So Manto, someone asked me, are you bored of it? Six years of work, and then now again, you're answering the same questions. And I'm like, no, because Manto is so special, and I've come here not just to introduce you to who Manto was, but also to invoke a Manto Yat, which some of my South Asian friends would understand, the Manto-ness that exists in all of us. So um, I don't want to say too much about the film, just for some of those who may not know the context. It's uh, set just before India got independence, and the country was partitioned, and the new it was the birth of the new country, Pakistan. And it's a story of four years, so it's before and after partition. There was a lot of sectarian violence, and writers at that time, artists, writers, were really the conscience of that society. So it is also to invoke that conscience in all of us, writers, artists, I think we need to speak up much more. And we have Anand Patwardhan, who has consistently spoken, so thank you for also supporting this. We've got David Hamilton somewhere, who's a producer of Fire, and all of you who have supported the kind of work that we all want to do, because without you, there would be no such film. So thank you, and I'm going to be here for the Q&A. So I hope we can have an honest, frank conversation after that. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome back to the stage Ms. Nandita Das. 
Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Welcome back to Toronto, Nandita, and, and thank, thank you, you very much for bringing your film here to us to share with our audiences. Um, and yeah, so I just want to start the questioning with uh, why was it important for you to bring Monto, his life and his stories, back in, or into the cultural conversation of 2018? Well, after seeing the film, I don't think ne I need to answer that. <laughs> I think um, I'm sure you see how relevant it is that even though we take you back to the 40s, everything that's happening at that time, what he's going through, um, the issues that he was grappling with are the same things that we are grappling with, whether it is um, identities on the basis of which we are being divided, whether it's national identity, religious identity, in India it's caste, and you know elsewhere it's race. So uh, that's, that's a theme that is very sort of close to my heart as well. And he really invokes this uh, identity of just being a human being and how difficult it is. And the second important theme that resonates today as well is the freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a, I think, an international phenomena, definitely in our country. We are being silenced. Writers and artists and filmmakers are uh, you know, being censored. Just very recently, some activists have been put behind bars for speaking up. So that's, again, something. And I personally, also as an actor, whether it was with fire, with water, then with Firak, there have been various forms of censorship, not necessarily just the government, the institutional censorship, but there are some self-proclaimed custodians of culture who also want to tell us what we must watch, what we must write. Then, you know, so we have to also speak up against those forces. And also some of us also censoring ourselves. Before anyone can even attack, there's a sense of fear. So it's, I think it kind of inspires you to be more courageous, more fearless, to have deeper convictions. And uh, for all of those reasons, I just, I mean, now one is kind of putting them in words. But when you just read the things he has written, what he stood for, you feel, wow, this, this one person has given me the opportunity to respond to today by just telling his story and telling the story of his times. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And I guess in the way that you are telling his story, you kind of do these seamless transitions between his his stories that he's written and his life. So, I'm, why? How did you come to that formal decision? That was again very. I think it was an instinctive decision. When I started thinking about this film, I felt like. If I had to do a film on a musician and not make you hear the music of that person, it wouldn't be fair. And the same reason why it's not enough for me to tell you that he was very sensitive to sex workers or people on the margins of society or how much partition impacted him. The largest mass migration in the world. And yet he doesn't tell you epic stories. He tells you personal, intimate stories. Mm -hmm. So right from the beginning, I felt like I want to weave in um, his stories. And I also wanted them to be seamless because those of you who might have read his works, the line between fact and fiction are very blurred. Mm -hmm. For some of the incident, like this whole incident of him feeling a sense of betrayal by Shyam is in a story uh, called Sahai, where the names have all been changed. And it's also in a biographical sketch about Shyam called Murli Ki Dhun, uh, which basically means the song of the flute, because Shyam uh, means Krishna, and Krishna had a flute. And you know, so there's a nice biographical sketch. And it's the same incident he writes in both with different names. So obviously, I mean, even this whole um, reasoning as to why he left obviously was an inference. I, I really don't know if that exactly was the reason, but the fact he wrote so much about it that it impacted him so much that he went on an impulse. Mm -hmm. So so I think that's why I also wanted the stories to be weaved in uh, ambiguously and seamlessly. You almost don't know when you've entered a story and you, and you probably know by the end of it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, the, the first story always shocked me a little bit when I saw that. Yeah. But, uh, you but kind of don't know, is it, everything seems okay, but it's not, it's something <laughs> sinister. Exactly. And I think that's how he dealt with his stories. Nothing was black and white. He felt the best of people had their shadows and the worst of people could be redeemed. And that's what is sort of interesting about the first story and you know mm -hmm. various other characters in his story. 
Well, th that's it. He was always about exposing the truth of the society and the city around him, like no matter how dirty it was. And uh, did you have any hesitations then about showing the the, the end of his life and his descent um, into alcoholism and how that affected his family and his, his work? Uh, when I began writing, it was a 10 year story. It was supposed to be from 42 to 52. But there was so much material that it kept getting narrower and narrower and it ended up being four year story. Um, I I didn't want to sort of go into the last years of his life. I mean, pretty much, you know, all alcoholics sort of die this similar way, mm -hmm. in a way. And But for me, what was interesting was that while his uh, life was spiraling downwards, his spirit wasn't. The fact he kept writing till the very end. Uh, and for me, that was more interesting. And that's why I chose to also end it with a certain resolve and a mm -hmm. certain, you know, strength, despite everything going wrong in his life. So that's why I wanted to sort of end it a little before he dies. Yeah, absolutely. And so you previously worked with uh, Nawaz Uddin uh, Siddiqui, Siddiqui. <laughs> on your first feature, Farak, um, and he just so embodied Manto here. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you discuss creating this portrait of, of him? I had thought of him from the time I was writing, and it was in 2013. I was in the jury of the short film, of, in the short film jury in Cannes, and he was there with a film. And I had still not really begun writing. I just had a broad story idea in mind, and I told him that this is what I'm doing. And he was super excited, and he said, I'm going to give two years or whatever time you need of my life. And then by the time I really got my act together with the script and the funding, he had become a huge star. And forget about two years, he didn't even have two months. So he said, you have done all the research. I'll just show up at, you know, on the set. Of course, we did meet before. We rehearsed a bit. I wanted to also see him, how he was with Safiya Rasika, who's a wonderful actress as well, and uh, see with some of the other key characters. So we did do some work, but not as much that I would have liked. But, you know, having done acting work myself, it's not always method. Like, <laughs> everyone asks him, what was your process and all of that. And I think he's a very instinctive actor. And there was a lot about Nawaz that sort of went with the character. Because a character who has so many contradictions is difficult to portray. And if an actor is really believable, you, you want to show someone who's arrogant and egoistic and yet deeply sensitive somebody who has so much moral courage and yet scared of going into jail. So it's not an easy character in 112 minutes for me to present you someone like that. And I felt that Nawaz has that effortless quality of sort of melting into the character. And also his eyes are very powerful. Mm -hmm. And that's something I wanted, you know, where you've lived life kind of eyes, they are different. <laughs> and uh, Nawaz has struggled a lot in his life as well. And so did Manto. And I think it's sort of beyond acting. It's it's more about just finding the right eyes, and I found them in Nawaz. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay, I'm going to open up the questioning to the audience now. Uh, so we have uh, Hawaii at the back there. Yeah. Yep, that's you. Yeah, with your hand up. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Okay, so the, f the first part of the question is, did you have any pushback about telling this story or uh, yeah, any... Well, pushed back in the sense that it's not easy to get funding for a film like this. Or you want to do a period film and then, you know, it's going to be in Urdu, no one's going to understand. Mm -hmm. You're going to have subtitles in India, like, you know, it just makes it more complicated. And so there were many reasons why it was felt that, why one shouldn't do it. Do you want to get a mega star, mm -hmm. you know, so there were reasons like that where there was a bit of pushback. Somebody would say, but why are you doing it on a Pakistani writer? I'm like, please, Manto is one person who shouldn't be divided on the basis of his nationality. Mm -hmm. You know, not because yeah. he lived three-fourths of his life in India, but he's as much Indian as he's Pakistani. He's one person whom we can happily and proudly say that he was one of the greatest South Asian short story writers. Mm -hmm. So... So there was all of that. And, you know, one is always being questioned when I did Firak, which was based on a story which was an aftermath of the Gujarat riots. People say, oh, why don't you do a film on Kashmir? You know, so similarly, say, why didn't you do a film on, uh, you're such a, you know, you talk about women's issues. Why didn't you do a film on Ismat Chuktai? 
or why didn't you do on an Indian writer like Prem Chand? Well, there are others who will do it, and I'll be, mm -hmm. you know, the first audience for it. But the point is, whatever touches you at that point, you want to tell that story. So there were pushbacks of different kinds, but I think once you're very convinced about something, you always find ways to make it happen. The world sort of conspires and you conspire. So um, your second question yeah, was? The second uh, question was uh, if there was any hesitation about the, the stories that you... Oh, which was the hardest part uh, to bring to life in, in Monto's tale? Uh, I don't know about hardest part. Of course, when you're writing, you know, you sort of, you have a flight of imagination. You're not thinking of the logistics of it. To recreate that period wasn't easy because a lot of the Bombay has completely changed the modern day clutter with grills and air conditions and satellite dishes. And if you don't have a huge budget for visual effects where you can remove things, you, or you know, you go to, there was a film set in the same period, they made a whole set in Sri Lanka. Obviously we didn't have money like that. Mm -hmm. So we had to you know, struggle within what we had. So we ended up, uh, you know, doing lots of recce, finding locations. Also, I wanted to shoot Lahore in Lahore, mm -hmm. and uh, which happened exactly at a time where there was a lot of indo pak political tension. So we weren't allowed to shoot there. So I had to find a Lahore in India. And uh, I'm a stickler for also finding the right place. I don't want the Lahoris to say, oh, this doesn't look like Lahore. <laughs> so, um, you know, we went to many different places. Also, I was quite clear from the beginning that I didn't want to do the landmark places of Lahore and Bombay. And this wasn't a touristy and, you know, like people say, what's your money shot? <laughs> it wasn't about all that. I was telling a story. Everything else just had to create that context enough for you to be transported then. So in some sense, I guess just finding, look, everything was difficult, to be honest. I mean, just writing the script was difficult. And then just when you think you're kind of there and you start finding locations, then you want to change the script and then, you know, to get locations. And it was like two films. You had Bombay and you had Lahore. So you couldn't repeat your actors. You couldn't repeat your locations. You couldn't repeat costumes. So when you sit and think, you, you don't realize what all a period film entails. And I'm not, I'm not really from the industry, even though I've done films as an actor. I've always done it by sort of more than an arm's length from it. So um, I'd never assisted anybody. I've not gone to a film school. So you're just kind of uh, drawing from your life experiences and common sense and hoping something will happen. <laughs> and uh, then you realize there's a lot more that goes into the pre-production. So I've learned a lot through this film, for sure. It's been a great training for my third film. Ooh, third film. <laughs> and it's not going to be 10 years away from where I am, yeah. hopefully sooner. Good. Okay, another question from the audience. Yes, it's front here. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, go no, ahead. no, you oh. go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Oh, 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 sorry. We have the, the questions just over here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the question is, uh, there's a lot of cameos and uh, the technical... By well-known. Yes, by well-known uh, Indian filmmaker, uh, film crews and cast. And was that always the intention to make it a pan-Indian kind of... Project. Well, I knew that I definitely didn't want to compromise in the way I was telling the story. And yet I wanted it to be very accessible. As you know, in, in, when we think of Indian cinema, we are thinking mainstream, we are thinking Bollywood. And uh, how do you make in today's times something that's accessible? Manto was an accessible writer. He wasn't just for the highfalutin or the you know, sort of literary people. He, common people used to wait for his column in the magazine. And I thought, OK, how do I make it more accessible without compromising? on anything else. And I thought, well, one way is to just ask a lot of well-known actors to come and do cameos. Maybe there'll be a little more interest and people say, oh, I want to see, you know, Rishi Kapoor or Gurdas Man or Ranveer Shori or whatever. And I used up all my goodwill by <laughs> calling up people shamelessly. Some I knew, some I didn't. And I told them, listen, they said, like, which character? Is it because you've thought of me while writing? I'm like, no, I've not thought of you at all while <laughs> writing. I just want you to support this film because I don't know how to reach it to people. I don't know how this whole marketing thing works. But, you know, I just want more people to come and see this story. And it'll help me. And also I wanted good actors who were known. So not just because they were known, but they had to be good. And 
and when so many people come to support they come with a very sort of a, an intent which is very pure and nice and that brings in a different kind of energy and they make the characters so believable so for those of you who don't know they were well known it doesn't matter they were still very right for the parts they were playing and you know for those who know there's always a nice pleasant surprise I'm like oh i never expected this person mm -hmm. to be in it and it's sort of there so yeah and in terms of the crew shikhar prasad was somebody i edited the film with for firak and um, but that time i didn't have a child so i could park myself in chennai mm -hmm. this time i couldn't so i had to do a lot of editing work with his assistant and you know so i learned more things you know if you if you have everything sorted i can tell you you would learn less in life mm -hmm. so i had enough problems so there was a lot of learning that happened and rasul called me up and said i want to be part of the film i was like sure he's a, he he did the sound for slum dog millionaire mm. and he's sort of a known um yeah so there are a lot of known unknown theater you know it's, it's kind of a mix the art direction was a first time art director and there was a french woman who was going to do actually the production design and then we just couldn't afford it yeah. and then i told her i said do you want to step up and just do the production design she's like do you have faith in me i said yes together we will crack it and we'll find it mm -hmm. and i'd done so much research i had such a bank of photographs and we chose some of, some really nice locations where even the switchboards and the furniture was right yeah. that it kind of helped her as well and you know she did a great job so fantastic <laughs> Can we have time for one more? I think there was this yes. lady. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, no, there's it's, a it's down lady here. here. Yeah. Well, I think the question Manto himself asks: Where do, where does one belong? And Toba takes in the whole story is Manto. He's trying to find where he belongs, right? I mean, here is a man who's Sikh. He's supposed to go to India because Sikhs and Hindus were supposed to go to India, but his village happens to be in Pakistan. You're kind of in the no man's land. Mm -hmm. And um, I've I've met a lot of people who've gone through partition, and the third generation, and they are far more forgiving. those who actually go through violence i don't know how your experiences have been but talking to some of these people they have seen madness on both sides mm -hmm. so they are far more forgiving um yeah. this is not a comment or news so pardon me if i sound like that but a lot of the third generations they hold much more anger this is what happened to my grandfather this is what happened to my grandmother whereas they have kind of let go they were like yeah those were terrible times but there were also people who helped us mm -hmm. you know so it's uh, this whole thing of belonging is something that also is of interest to me like i feel like a citizen of the world and yet i happen to be an indian but i'm not like sort of ultra nationalistic which again means that i'm not being sort of in today's times if you are not nationalistic they yeah. they might lynch you but yeah. you know <laughs> yeah. the point is that uh, what is that feeling of where you belong you know you are where your loved ones are or is it where you you were born in i mean that's an eternal question and each one has to answer for themselves mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you yeah. thank you that was the idea of doing yes. it so yeah i'm sorry we don't have any more time for questions but thank you so much nandita for bringing you your for film coming. to us and thank you all <laughs> and uh, the film is eligible for and the for film is releasing on 21st september okay. in india so those yes. of you who have families friends fill that form that cameron said <laughs> for me to yes. get a reach to people back home to be honest while these festivals are lovely and i thoroughly enjoy it but that's where i really want to have those conversations mm -hmm. so yes. any help would be appreciated that's thank it. you